It takes years to learn to read the human heart. One test cardiologists use, called left ventricular ejection fraction, or LVEF, shows how well a person's heart is functioning. It shows how well blood is pumping through the left ventricle and whether a patient has had a heart attack or heart failure. It's typically performed by a human sonographer and reviewed by a cardiologist. But researchers at Cedars-Sinai Hospital in Los Angeles have been training an artificial intelligence system to interpret the results. This is a deep learning convolutional neural network that's video-based as opposed to image-based. It's been fed the equivalent of six to eight years worth of echocardiograms from a large hospital, so about 150K thousand images. And this allows the model to be very precise and accurate in assessing heart function. To test the system, researchers took around 3,500 scans and assigned half to an AI reader and half to humans. The results were assessed by cardiologists. For more than half of the set, they were unable to tell the difference between the analysis produced by AI and what humans had done. And when looking at the diagnoses that AI generated, they needed less correction less often as the scans analyzed by humans. In many ways, AI leverages the expertise of great clinicians, but it doesn't take away the, the art or the insight of the actual diagnosis. And putting the whole picture together. It's very complementary and very helpful for the clinical workflow. Radiologists are also beginning to use AI-aided detection tools for breast and lung cancer. It's very good at finding fine detail um, that a human would have to spend a lot of time um, looking for. Another aspect that uh, AI might be very helpful for is following up something over time. It's good at, computers are good at measuring stuff, so seeing if a tumor gets bigger or smaller with treatment, if a patient is responding or not, and might require a change of treatment. Doctors say these tools will complement humans in the clinic, not replace them. Because at the end of the day, they're all tools, and they, will make mis they currently are not perfect. They make mistakes, so you do need that expert radiologist to, to make that final decision. And that means doctors could potentially work faster and identify risks more accurately to improve health outcomes for patients. Charles Senseo is an associate professor of library and information science at Rutgers University. He's joining us now from New Jersey. Thank you very much indeed for being with us. The, the, the subject that Colin was talking about in his report there was obviously to analyze a very specific um, instance and very narrow region uh, of analysis. But AIs do need vast amounts of data. What happens if very small amounts of data are either missing or wrong? Yes, thank you, and it's wonderful to be here. Um, that can cause uh, bias, that can result in imprecise or imperfect, or perhaps more importantly, uh, we don't know where some of those errors may, may, may be causing issues. And what's particularly problematic about that is that this, these errors can occur in very high-risk situations in terms of diagnostics as well as treatment plans. So there, while I'm certainly a supporter of uh, AI research, uh, applying um, AI in healthcare applications, we should be careful about errors and bias that may be embedded in some of the systems that we are using and relying upon to make clinical decisions. So how would you see a system like this working then? If it still requires um, a, a backup check, for want of a better phrase, of a human against an AI, in a sense that almost seems that you're, one is duplicating the work, although I appreciate the speed at which the AI could operate, would be much greater. How, does the, how do you see this interaction working? Well, one, there are a couple of things that we can do to help uh, enhance the tools that we use in these such critical applications. First, diversifying the AI research community itself. And there are important initiatives uh, here in the States to diversify STEM research it, all the way down to middle schools and high schools, as well as undergraduate and graduate programs to help bring in different perspectives and different orientations around what data we should be collecting and how to interpret that data. Another thing we can do, number two, is to diversify the health and health adjacent data sets. If the data that we're collecting itself is not representative of the communities that we're, we're making decisions uh, with, uh, with this data, 
then it follows that some of these uh, decisions may be suboptimal or may be resulting in harm. One example of that is with social determinants of health data. So we know that social determinants help to uh, uh, influence health behavior and health outcomes. For example, financial strain is a social determinant that's well known. This is over decades, two or three decades of research that supports the notion, which we can probably imagine in our own lives, where a financial barrier and not having enough money to pay, say, for example, for a copay for an office visit or mm. for a medication may drive or may influence our medication behavior. We know that that is the case for certain populations. However, our systems currently don't do a very good job of understanding where and which social determinants may be impacting health behaviors. So Let our systems do a pretty good job of knowing when we fill the script, a prescription, but we really don't know why if we haven't filled it. Let me ask you just briefly, um, medical professionals obviously developed a, develop a sense of certain things during their work because of the level of experience that they've got and the amount of, uh, of uh, patients they see, the, the, the circumstances under which they work. They can never sometimes put their finger on why they know something is different, they just know something is different. Is there a risk, do you think, that we are going to get to the point where we rely too much on AI and that sense of this being something different gets lost? We may. I mean, there, there are a lot of uh, in, intuition, of course, that with medical decisions and clinical decisions, and we can't account for every particular patient's circumstance. And this notion of individualized care is just that. And that relationship between the provider, in this case, the physician, and the patient is so important to understanding what nuances and where some of those senses come from. And that's an important part of delivering care. And those of us who work in health informatics try to support both physicians, practitioners, and patients in that interaction to make that uh, sort of a data or an information-informed decision. However, there are biases that, that occur in the patient-doctor interaction that have occurred long before AI became a part of uh, our healthcare decision-making. And in some of the work that, that I do in talks that I give, I say that sometimes the machine may start acting like the humans in that they can reflect some of the same biases as well. So while that sense and intuition is very important in the process of providing care, we know that there are disconnects and there are biases right. that result from them, both in AI-informed applications as well as in patient-doctor interactions for which AI is not a factor. Charles and Centeo, we appreciate you being with us in Al Jazeera, so thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you. Wonderful to be here.